a thousand dollars. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I don't like this. Welcome to the Whiskey Tribe. I'm Rex, this is Daniel, and today we are talking about $10 versus $1,000 whiskeys. What's the difference? Yes. Because we've been in a, a unique position the past couple of years. What's that? In the last few years, we've easily crossed over a thousand bottles of whiskey. Yeah. Every single one of them, different ones. And that's given us a really interesting insight into price points and craft versus big brand and all these different variations. Right. So let's get this out of the way. Prices, the vast majority of the time, there are going to be local differences. We are not talking about the outliers. We're talking about the middle of the pie. But beyond just the rarity of a whiskey, are there some characteristics of your higher end, more expensive whiskeys that you don't find in the lower end, cheaper bottom shelf whiskeys? And I, the answer is- I think so, yes. Yeah. But I also think that there's a window, right? Yeah. So with the price points, they're gonna be diminishing returns. We'll get into what we think those diminishing return yeah. points are. But first, first let's start with this whiskey here. Henry McKenna, I've seen this for ten damn dollars. Ten dollars. Here, have some ten dollar no, whiskey. Oh, you all just. You, oh, wait a minute. You hold. Oh, you want the thousand dollar whiskey? Yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Let me handle this for you. No. This is a special edition John F. Fitzgerald twenty year old whiskey. Okay. And nice. a half bottle is a thousand dollars. So technically, you know, you could almost call this a two thousand dollar bottle of whiskey. One of the main differences you're going to find is super obvious. Older whiskeys are often going to be priced. Higher, just because they have more age invested into a barrel. Exactly, and there's less of them because of angel share. There's a lot of people who feel like, well, older is always better when it comes to whiskey. Older's just different when it comes to whiskey. And for you, different might be better if you like what happens to a whiskey as it gets older. And that will change based on what country it's in. So for example, a really old scotch, it, I've always described really old scotches as it's like taking a river stone, throwing it in, or a stone, throwing it in a river, waiting a hundred years and coming back, and now it's a skipping stone. Yeah. Right? Time, like water, rubs off all the rough edges of scotch. Right. And then you can crack it open with a little bit of water. Bourbon, not the same. Because bourbon is using new oak. Mm -hmm. The older a bourbon gets, the more the wood starts to take over. I think a couple of times we may have experienced that with scotches too, with your truly ancient yes, a few things times. that are like 20 plus, 30 plus. Yeah, they got years sort old. of barrel bitter. Yeah. So in the States, it's a warmer climate, that over oakiness. That can happen relatively quickly. So age is not going to be a perfect indicator of how good a whiskey should be, but it's very often going to affect how expensive it is. Now, another thing you're usually gonna find in your more expensive whiskeys is uh, you're able to find higher proofs. Mm -hmm. That's um, the, the more percentage of alcohol in there. And that's usually because a distillery can proof a whiskey down to 80 proof, 40% alcohol, and still legally call it whiskey. And get more money because there's more bottles. Absolutely. But if a distillery is selling something at cask strength, it means whatever was in the barrel, that's what they're putting into a bottle. It means they have a lot fewer bottles of that to sell just because it's concentrated in there. Then you have the other option, which is let's proof this down to 43%, even though it's an 18 year old whiskey, yeah. sell for a whole lot of money and because we're called McAllen. Yeah. And everyone knows McAllen means quality. Yeah, well. In the branding circles, right? We have had, so, we have had some exceptional McAllen. Yes, and I, no, I like McAllen, but what I'm saying is like Levi's jeans or you know any branded thing, right. sometimes you pay for brand right and and that's because they've done a great job of communicating their value to the consumer so if I'm thinking of characteristics that you're generally gonna find in your more expensive whiskeys versus your lower whiskeys, mm -hmm. this is going to be uh, it's just so hard to do because it's oh, pull, every generalization pull, is gonna be wrong it's gonna be rule of thumb though we're talking about yeah. the meaty part of the bell curve and what you're usually gonna find is more richness more intensity of the flavors, density to those flavors, there's more complexity, there's more nuance most of the time. I don't disagree with you. Let's talk about where that line breaks. Yes. Okay, so for true, beautiful complexity in American spirits, you can get there at the 30 to $50 range easily, right? Uh, in Scotch, you can get there in the 50, these days, 40 to $50 range Bam, you're now into a whole world of just magnificent whiskeys. You start getting below 30 in scotch and one proof hits the floor and goes right. to 40 and then it starts to simplify and then the thing flavors get blended out because they're going for quantity 
And the same thing in American spirits when you get things like Henry McKenna where there's going for a mass release, right. just old enough to not have an age statement whiskey, mm -hmm. then it's going to taste simple, classic bourbon. Not bad, not bad, right. just kind of boring. For the true whiskey nerds out there, yes. there's gonna be a lot of people though. You give something that is really rich and intense and cast strength and complex and it has this ridiculous journey of flavors before it finishes in an interesting way, they're not gonna know what to do with that. This is gonna be like, this is weird, this is too much, and they will absolutely prefer something just sweet and simple, and for them, there's no reason to even start working yourself towards the higher end expensive whiskeys. There was actually a study done about wine sommeliers, and what they found was, in a blind group of people trying wines, most could correctly identify the cheapest and the most expensive wine, mm -hmm. but it wasn't because they liked the most expensive wine. Mm. They all described the most expensive wine as more complex, right. more nuanced, more going on, and then finished that sentence with, but I don't really like it. Yeah. They almost universally preferred the mid-range, not budget and crap, not overly expensive, the blends and the middle of night down home plate stuff, right. right? And so when you're looking for somebody who doesn't thrive on complexity, then a more complex whiskey is not a better whiskey to them. Is that 200 times as good as this? No, it's not 200 times as good as this. If we're talking about more expensive whiskeys being the ones that are usually gonna offer a density of flavors and intensity and richness that do interesting flourishes with the finish, that kind of whiskey is usually coming out of a copper pot still as opposed to a column still. So let's talk about why that is. Because when you're in a copper pot still, you're doing a distillation run and you're choosing the part that you keep. So some stuff comes off, I don't wanna keep that, let's start now, let's start keeping it, and then let's keep it, keep it, keep it, now the rest of it is not good. And that's called the heart cut. And how wide the heart cut is, or how narrow it is, or where in the run it is, all those are gonna change the flavors, and it's going to keep, depending on the reflux and everything, it's going to keep a lot more of the congeners and the oily, rich flavor components, right? right. A column still, is based on a plate system that strips things out so that when you choose it to come off here, you're simply getting exactly what you want at the exact proof you want and collecting it and everything else stays behind. Upside of it is it's efficient. Yes. And it strips off all the weird stuff. Yep. The downside is it strips off some of the things that also add to the richness and the flavor. And so a shortcut to complexity is, is it pot stilled? And again, qualifiers, but that's a shortcut. Shortcut, but that, Still, it's going to take longer to get more whiskey out of that. It's, it has less yield. And that's gonna make it more expensive. More expensive, right. <laughs> now, I will tell you, a lot of people say um, in Scotland that I, my Scottish friends, like, well, that's why we don't like bourbon because it's all column still and they don't understand. <laughs> and the, the, here's the difference is, in Scotland and Ireland, column stills are allowed to make a much higher proof cut. Mm -hmm. And so the whiskey coming off the column still is actually uh, way higher in proof. In America, we actually have limits to how high you can run the column still. Is that to get a categorization for bourbon or just yes, any whiskey? Yes, for bourbon rye, to get a categorization okay. for bourbon rye or malt or that, that kind of thing. You are actually not distilling it so high that you strip everything out of it. Yeah. So yes, it's less than a pot still, but no, it's not as much as trying to create vodka. It's gonna be different for from category to category, but in American whiskey, let's do this, the window. The entry point to start getting complexity, nuance, more characteristics that you would associate with more expensive whiskeys to start getting in there as opposed to the point of diminishing returns where if you spend that much money, it's just, you're- That's it. Yeah. So my entry level, I'm gonna say I've found some truly wonderful whiskeys in the 30-ish dollar range. Okay, American whiskeys. That whiskey. I would be comfortable with. American whiskeys, right. I'd agree. And I've never spent more than 200. Ooh. An American whiskey. Okay. And so, thought, yeah, that was worth it. So you think your diminishing returns point is all the way up to $200. Yeah, but remember, I'm not a bourbon uh, fanatic as much as I love scotch. See, my diminishing returns price point for an American whiskey is like $85. Yeah, I've got, I've had some over $100 whiskeys that I went, yeah, that was totally worth it. Okay. Now, scotch. Okay, scotch. I'm saying 45 I was gonna say 40 Okay. But sometimes 30. you can get Lafroy 10 for so, $30. For me, my entry price point for that jumps between like $40, $50 to start getting into it. That goes, mine goes up to like $80 to $90. Oh, no, no, diminishing no, no, returns. No. Three to 400 Ah, oh. So, it's, it's diminishing returns. I'm not saying there's no additional stuff there, but I'm saying once you get past $80 to $90, 
what you're getting beyond the money being spent. No, I've had I've had single malt with our Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys that were two fifty, three hundred dollars a bottle. Yeah, and I went. I wish I could have bought all that they made of this one because I've never had anything like it. Do you remember what it was? It's in my office. Daniel, I have the, uh, an idea. Let's go to your office. Okay. All right, Whittington, you have one chance. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> the upper threshold for diminishing returns yes. for me, for Scotch, yes. right now is about $90. You said you had something better. That's weak. I may need multiple samples to be sure. That's chunk change. Convince me. So for example, one of my favorite things is the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. They go throughout Scotland, you know, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, yeah. finding interesting barrels Okay. And usually single barrels, but sometimes bigger releases, and then releasing just that barrel under a style and a name. Is sometimes it... they tell you what distillery it's from, and sometimes they don't. Okay. If you like scotch. Right. It's great. I'll take three chances at it. Now, we'll pull this one, because this is the oldest one in here. Okay. Tipple of the Bramble Hunter, the Full Metal Hospital. Done. And then three more. Nope. <laughs> three. <laughs> okay. So one of these is $115, one is $125, and one of them is $270. I am judging these based on what I know I can get for like 80, 90 bucks. Right, fair enough. And diminishing returns doesn't mean is there something interesting and better but about it, it, worth that but, much it more but is it worth that much more money? Okay, so it's Tipple of the Bramble Hunter, Okay. and this comes from Kregelicki. This one oh. is a single cask, one of 205 bottles, 63%. So on Just the nose, right out of the barrel. On the nose, this isn't black pepper in terms of like spicy burn. This is black pepper in terms of the actual flavor on the nose. Yeah. The smell on the nose is just straight up. But see how the com complexity there is? There's the actual, yeah. like the brush and the, the woods, right? Almost. Like hiking through a trail. So it's, it's very nice. It's yeah. lovely. So next is Full Metal Hospital, which is a Campbelltown, which is one of my favorite regions. Yeah. And it is a 11-year-old Glen Scotia, ringing in at 58.8%. What was the name of this? $125 a bottle. Oh, and there's that. There's that Springbank yeah, uh, medicinal. medicinal rubber. It's got way more nuance and subtlety than the nose would imply, but then the oils just swell and envelop everything. Think back to the most expensive whiskey I think we've had. McAllen M. McAllen M. That was like, I don't know, a few thousand dollars. It was really nice, but I'm not seeing... It was not that much better than the 18. I'm not seeing a, an entire other tier of quality above and beyond. You ready? If you really want to convince, then Zach over here can, can, can go get more. <laughs> no, 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 don't do it, Zach. Wow. He has not been around you long enough. His strength. We'll yeah, have a conversation like, later. This, yeah. These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> okay, this is Linkwood. It's called Will Brighten Your Day. It is a space side, right. and it's 28 years old. Okay. And this one is $270. Now, I would argue that a 28-year-old single malt for only 270 oh, bucks oh, is a yeah. pretty damn good deal. You understand diminishing returns. Yeah. I'm not talking about is it better, are there new things. It's like... Are there so few slight and minor new things that it's really not worth the added, the tremendous added expense? I say that this one is only because of, for that price point, for that age, that's a low price point. In the reverse direction, if you want an almost 30 year old whiskey, you're typically gonna spend over $500. What? To get one for 270 bucks that you already know is a distillery that you love, right? that's pretty cool. It's not what will the market bear, it's at what point do we think the characteristics of whiskeys, yeah. do those start to fall short and diminishing returns kick in and you're gonna pay a lot more money to get See, very, I, I very little additional quality yeah. and nuance and complexity. I have a fundamental disagreement with you, and that's the assumption that people buy things objectively and with reason, and that they enjoy them objectively and with reason. Neither of those things is true. So you're talking about this study where whenever people invest more money into a thing, they enjoy the thing more yeah, because they, they yes they put more into it so they get more enjoyment out of it scientifically their pleasure centers of their brain report more activity when they think they should be enjoying something more so story matters right the story of this is a whiskey that went into barrels 28 years ago sure and now you're getting to try it 
I will say, if anybody has the opportunity to sample, you know, like, a pappy is a mm -hmm. huge popular thing now. Um, an incredibly old scotch, and if you can get like a pour of it, right? You don't have to invest in a whole bottle, but just to have that experience. Yeah, I would say- That may be worth the, the cost of a pour. I would say that if you're gonna go out of your way to try something like that, make it an experience. Don't try to get it to just, it better stand on its own. I spent so much money. It's like, no, and if you're gonna do something like that, do it with friends and on purpose, make it a big deal. Make the story fun so that the whole memory of trying that Pappy for the first time is actually the story surrounding when you did it, who you were with, and what you did, and then the bourbon will actually taste better. The Scottish Malt Whiskey Society, yes. that's the name, and yep. then Signatory is another, these are independent bottling companies. Right. Essentially what they do is they take stuff produced by other people and do something with it, then bottle it and sell it. Crowded Barrel, always making stuff, but one of the things that was always been in the plans was to source in really interesting ways. And the independent bottling route is a model that's already been done successfully in other countries, not so much the states. But what's more common in America is to do vanity branding, which means you source and then you put your own brand on it and you don't tell anybody where it came from. Right. That's way more common, but what we wanted to do was source and feature, which means source something interesting and then tell the whole world who made it and where it came from. The label we're doing this under is the Crowded Barrel Alliance and we're on the hunt for the coolest, most interesting whiskeys we can get. Right now we're doing one barrel at a time and we're trying to focus only on craft distillers. And as often as there is a decision point, all of the Magnificent Bastards in the Patreon, yes, will be voting on those decision points. Now Daniel. Yes. You remember the last episode? <laughs> you dump Do you know why it ended that way? Why? Your secret stash was bogus. No, it was a real secret stash. No, look at look at what. Right, look, look, look. Son of a bitch. The end of the last episode, you were punished for your insolence. Yeah, it was called the secret stash. I don't know what you're talking about. I I propose a competition of wits to get the real location of your secret stash. Do you agree? <laughs> sure. This is what we're playing. This is what we're playing for. This is what we're playing for. Wait, what? What we're playing for. Both of your whiskeys. Ah! <laughs> I don't like this. And, uh, either. <laughs> and the location of your secret oh, stash. Oh no, we're not of playing for that. Of your secret stash. Nope. Hey, okay, what if, what if he beats you uh, not Those once, are the terms. not twice, but three times. He's been trained by you. Well, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> we, we've been sitting around hanging out, talking Daniel, about you, how magic is immoral. Just chatting. <laughs> You've worked with me for like a few years now. Uh huh. You know how long it takes me to learn anything. Bro. Fair enough. Three in a row. Three in a row. Okay. Would you prefer uh, that I dealt or Rex dealt? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about my stash. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, uh yeah. Mahjong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is okay. okay. So we're, we're just gonna do single hands. Whatever okay. you get, whoever wins is the winner. <laughs> so make the best hand that... you got. Tell, tell me what you can make. Ooh. Okay. Oh, that shit's nasty. Oh, it's painful. You have no. I feel chance. like I'm. I feel like I'm being led to the slaughter wait, right I don't know, now. Wait, wait, why? Why? Because trip queen. Because it was so good. You were triple Pair of queens. Aces. Wait, oh, you have a full house. You have three jacks. Yeah. Oh, that's I know. very exciting. Yeah. So I believe that's. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, good, done. Wait, wait, I don't like any of this. <laughs> I, had a, I had a whiskey and I was very excited about it. Gonna work for that this whiskey. is a, all right, all right, all right, you know what? Yeah. This, time, this time, this time we're gonna be even more fair. Okay. I'll show you a card. Okay. You can either decide you can keep it or give it to Rex. Can I do this every single card? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, keep it. Oh, shoot, no, I shouldn't have kept that one. Keep it. Keep it. <laughs> I'm getting worked. Keep it. Now what's gonna happen? No. 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 Uh, no. So there you go. All right, all right. Make the best hand you can. Uh, I'm doing much better this oh, time. Oh, three queens is pretty good. Oh, Maybe yeah. you won. Oh, oh no. Yeah, I oh, forgot. House. I miscounted on the eights. I had oh. one in my head. All right, here, here. We're gonna make it the most fair possible. 
Let's do this. You went first the last time, so Rex will go first this time. Choose one card. Right. You take a card, you take a card, you take a card, you take a card. See, it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that instant what disdain. A, what a joke. Make the best hand it's you can. It's not fair. <laughs> oh, I'm man, so I'm savoring this I'm moment. I'm hosed. <laughs> you have no idea how long. There's no way you would win three times how in a long? row. I got fucking nothing. <laughs> Two pair, jacks, queen. To a oh, mm. yeah. So, can I have a little whiskey? <laughs> it's a little whiskey. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just need something to take the edge off of losing three in a row. Oh, <laughs> it may or may not be connected to the master suite. See you later. No. If you guys want to watch me learning that trick from Brian, the video is right up here. It's on Scam Nation. Check it out. Yeah.